to the Church of God. We are so glad you are here today. Um, this morning I was reading from Psalm 145 and I thought I would share a few verses with you. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. So let us sing with joy about his righteousness this morning. Let's praise his name together. So please join us in singing. Stand if you would like.
sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. next song we are doing is not one we've actually sung in church before, but if you listen to Christian radio, I think you will find it very familiar. It's Eye of the Storm and the, some of the words of the chorus. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. <laughs> Remind me in the eye of the storm. 
When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I pictured slowly fade away. When the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name. In the eye of the storm, test comes in and the doctor says I've only got a few months left. It's like a bittersweet pill I'm swallowing. I can barely take a breath. When addiction steals my baby girl and there's nothing I can do. My only hope is to trust in you. In the eye of the storm in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control. God, we stand here for some of us in the eye of the storm, for some of us that are facing things in this life, in this world, that bring an enormous amount of uncertainty, that can bring, bring pain, that can cause us to, to cry, to hurt. Lord, we acknowledge this, because not all life is filled with roses and sunshine. The rain falls, the storms come, and in the midst of it all, you remain. Lord, you are the one anchor, the one thing that we can trust and count on. You do not fail us. You do not run away or abandon us. Your love surrounds us and your grace is ever present. Lord, give us the strength to turn to you not just when we don't know where else to turn, but in all things, that we would live this life of faith in such a way that we would acknowledge and recognize your goodness moment to moment, day to day. And so for Lord, for all the requests we have, all the things in our hearts, for those in the hospital, for those struggling with diagnoses and different things, events that have happened, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who feel betrayed, for all that are hurting. May your grace and mercy be with them. And Lord, may you guide us all according to your will and your word in all things. And Lord, we ask this in your most holy name. Amen. You can be seated. Okay, I'm doing the announcements today. Um, first off, giving. Um, we don't pass the plate anymore, but um, there's the box in the back and also plates in the back, and you can, of course, give online as well. Um, 
we appreciate your obedience in doing that. So uh, announcements wise, it was great to have so many people at the picnic last week. We certainly had some beautiful weather and the meal was delicious. And I even got some leftovers, which I enjoyed for lunch for a couple days. So hopefully some of you also, I know there was plenty of leftovers. So <laughs> quite a few people got that taken home. So thank you, special thank you to Viola and Sharon and Sharon and Sarah. Um, I'm sure there was other people because there was quite a big group that were um, putting stuff together on Saturday night. But thank you for that. That was a really nice time. Um, discipleship group is on Wednesday nights at six o'clock. This week we're starting the book of Ruth. We're going to do Ruth for four weeks. So if you'd like to try us out for a little bit, um, come and learn about Ruth and we'd love to have you so that we just meet back here at the church at six o'clock. Um, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So I'm not exactly sure what people are planning or things are going on with that. Uh, mark your calendars for the annual business meeting on November 7th. Uh, it is right after the service. We do need a minimum number of people to attend, but it's um, an important time to hear what's going on and the plans um, moving forward. Uh, State Youth Convention is November 12th through the 14th. I think we have a pretty good group of kids that are planning on going to that. Um, this morning, you may have been handed an envelope with um, updated, requesting updated information um, for your contact information. Kim Martin is the point person, I guess, for that, <laughs> at least the collecting. So um, it's been a couple of years since we've updated our directory. So even if you think, oh yeah, my information hasn't changed, please fill it out. Um, so we are sure that we have the correct information and you can mark on there if you want it to um, be kept private and not published in the directory. Um, our Christmas party is December 3rd, and there is a planning meeting on October 10th after the service. So if you would like to help in the planning of that October 10th, um, stay after church, and um, we can do that. And then look forward to December 3rd. Hopefully we can have a, another wonderful party. We didn't get to do it last year. So I think those are all of the announcements. I'm sorry, I can't let this pass. Kim Martin's in charge of the directory. <laughs> How many names do you plan to change? Just for funsies. All of them. <laughs> oh my, all right. Kids, youth, we love you, you are awesome. Have fun, Jay. <laughs> And for those of you that maybe haven't heard of or been to one of our Christmas events, uh, this is, we call it a Christmas party, but it really is a, one of the things that I've appreciated here uh, is that whole event is, we, we do it over, at, hopefully at AgriLiquid, we'll, I think that's, I don't know if that's happening. Yes, there's nodding happening, so yes, it'll be back over there. But it is such a low-key event, all kinds of good food, fun fellowship, uh, kids, adults, if there's talents, things like that, they can bring forward. It can be serious, it can be not serious, but it's really is designed for us to just be ourselves as a community. And uh, there have been moments that in that where people are moved to tears and laughter and generally it's just a great event all the way around. And if anybody was ever there, I'm going to Talk up, to, talk up to her when Ellie Becker sang her song at four years old or whatever it was. And all the grandmothers in the room are me like, he's so cute. And just these memorable moments that were there. And so we really encourage you to make that a priority. Uh, and it would be great to be together. Um, so there's my sales pitch for that. How's that? How are y'all doing? Jan, everything is always better when you're here. Just remember that. <laughs> Truth. No. Um, I just... <laughs> no, I just uh, need a moment to just kind of collect my own thoughts for a minute here. Just 
If you wouldn't mind, let's just take a moment to, I know we just prayed, but, and we pray too much. I don't, I don't think we're always supposed to be praying. Let's just take a moment and pause and let's just be present right here. God's people coming before him to hear his word. Lord, may your work be done here this morning. May the word said be yours. Lord, may your Holy Spirit shape our minds and our hearts. Lord, help us to consider, to reflect. Help us to feel what we need to feel. Lord, help us to see things in new ways. And Lord, most of all today, we seek your will. Show us the path forward and give us the courage to walk it. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the last sermon uh, of this particular theme we've been on. Ordinary people having extraordinary moments with God. These sacred moments kinds of things. Just these, these glimpses of what this is and, and how God works in people's lives. And just as a heads up, we're going to be taking the next several couple months, next several weeks, uh, we're going to be digging deep into First and Second Corinthians. So if you want to prepare and read ahead, then just first the letter, the first, not Corinthians, Thessalonians. I felt that, Shelby. Um, first Thessalonians. So if you want to prepare ahead, I would invite and encourage you. Thessalonians is a very short book. It is not going to take you very long to read. Uh, I encourage you to be reading it once a week or so. Uh, let those words kind of sink in. And as we gather back together and if we process them together, it is my belief that the same spirit that worked in that church in Thessalonica can be at work amongst us here. Amen? All right, so we are going to talk about the Gerasene demoniac today. Anybody want to attempt to pronounce that? Um, and you're like, wow, I thought this was supposed to be ordinary people. <laughs> well, it is, actually. Uh, we don't know this man's name. All we know is how he comes to Jesus and what happens when he encounters Jesus. And this story is fairly sensational. In fact, I have in, the, in, my, in my manuscript here a couple encouragements to not turn this into a movie. So sometimes things will get mentioned and our instinct might be to, to move that to, to movie level drama stuff. And I don't want us to go there. Let's keep this human. But I do want us to hear the story. So I'm going to read the whole story to you, the, the Luke version. And it's found in Luke chapter 8. And I'm going to read verses 26 uh, through 39. So again, it's a story. And that might seem like a lot of reading, but it really isn't. Uh, I just encourage you to listen to the story. Listen to, to what happens and listen to who is there. And pay careful attention to how people and how everyone responds to what Jesus says and does in the story. So Luke 8, 26 through 39. Then they, and they being Jesus and his disciples, arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus has commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there was a hillside with a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let him enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it to the city and the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, 
they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Heard the story before, right? Demons, pigs, crowds, Jesus. There's a lot here. And so the question is where to start. And I think it is, who is this guy that meets Jesus by the water? Also, where and what is Gerasenes? Maybe let's tackle that first. Because there's a lot going on in the story, and not all of it I can read to you. I read the whole story, but it's situated in a context. In other words, there's things that happened before this, and there's things that happen after this that are all meant to be read together. And so Gerasenes is the opposite of Galilee. And that means a lot of things. One, it was on the other side of the lake. It was a journey to get there. There's this whole story that happens right before this of Jesus telling they're gonna, the disciples, they get a boat and they're going to go and they get out into uh, the lake and the wind starts to blow and the storm starts to come and Jesus is asleep in the boat. And the disciples wake him up. They think they're going to die and, and Jesus is grumpy with them because of their lack of faith. And he calms the storm. Right before he shows up on the shoreline, Jesus demonstrates his power over the storm, over nature. When Jesus gets back, he's going to have a woman. That There's a whole crowd waiting for him to get back in Galilee. It's interesting to note the crowd on the Gerasene side wanted Jesus to leave. They were afraid. And the crowd on the Galilee side wanted him back. They met him at the shore. And he gets there. He's going through this crowd, and this woman reach out and touches him. And she'd been having a problem that she'd been struggling with, bleeding for 12 years. And just in the act of touching him, she finds healing. Next, the very next thing that happens is there's this young, this daughter who has died, and Jesus goes to the house. She's not dead, she's asleep. Child, get up. The child gets up. And Jesus demonstrates his power over the physical body, life and death. This whole section is about the power and authority of Jesus. And how Jesus and that power and authority, that which God gives, is greater than, more than, all of these other powers that are happening. And also, there's, there's not real clear agreement on where Gerasenes is. There's all these places that start with G, and none of them are quite that. And I think that's important. Because I, won't, I want to be careful that we don't read the story as Jesus got up from this place, went to that place, did this thing, and left. The where matters. And being opposite of Galilee is not just a geographical reference. It's on the other side of the lake in a place that is not Jewish. In other words, they would be Gentile or Greek. These are people who did not believe the same things that people in Galilee believed. They did not live a similar lifestyle. They were different. They were foreign. And Jesus goes to them. I think there's something we need to note in that. I also think it has something to do with how they respond to Jesus when they see the supernatural work that is done. Once again, Jesus is crossing all these lines. He's in a foreign land with foreign people. 
And he's going to demonstrate supernatural power over spirit, over what is unseen. And he's going to bring healing to one no one else could do anything with. The man, he's described in inhuman terms, right? I mean, he's almost feral. I mean, you can almost see him. Like, this is a guy, he's running around naked. Now, before you get too graphic, he's probably in his underwear. But uh, he's not dressed, and certainly not dressed appropriately for society. He lives out amongst the tombs, keeping company with the dead. He'd rather be there than in the city with people, with his family, with people that might know him. When they try to help him, because many times they did, as the way it's described, when they try to help him, even if it's to keep him safe from himself and locking him up, posting a guard, putting chains on his, his hands, he breaks out, he breaks through, and he ends up back out in the wild. You get this picture of a man that's not just troubled, but also aggressive uncontrolled and you get a picture of a, a community that's tried everything that it can to help this person and they're unable to do so whatever has been troubling him whatever's causing this aggression this, this desire for him to be separate from was greater than anything that they could deal with you also get the picture of one who has been rejected and who is rejecting one who has been thrown into prison for his actions and ran into the wilds and lives among the tombs rather than live amongst people. Lost to reason and lost to society, you find a character that we could easily put into a horror movie. An almost unstoppable force that we can't control, that is aggressive, that's outside of how the world is supposed to work. We have this picture of this man, and it's not human. But isn't it interesting that the first person to meet Jesus on the shore is this man? Jesus never makes it off the shore. He gets on a boat, he crosses, and boom, right there on the shore is this guy. Greeting him on behalf of the city, I'm not sure that that is the first introduction that they would want to have happen. But he's the one who met Jesus. And what do we see happen when he meets Jesus? Does he attack Jesus? Anybody? No. Does he run away from him? No. In fact, you almost wonder, like, how did he know to be there? He falls down to his knees, perhaps even to his face, in the presence of Jesus. The one who could not be controlled, who would break every chain, who would run into the wilds and live amongst the tombs, the most unclean, violent, dehumanized person you could describe, meets Jesus on the shore and is subdued immediately. I don't think that's a small detail. He falls down and he cries out. And he is not confused about who Jesus is, is he? The son of the most high God. That's how he's described. How would he even know that? I mean, we take it for granted because we hear it so much. But remember, this is not a place where Jewish people went. He recognized the authority and power of God. presence of God 
did what society could not, what this man could not. And the uncontrolled became controlled. The violent became calm. The problem that no one could solve had a solution. And it was found in the presence of Jesus. This is what we believe. This is why we gather. Because the presence of Christ changes the world we live in. That which we see no answer to has an answer in faith in Jesus Christ. That uncontrolledness within us has a pathway to greater life, to salvation through Christ. That the realities of this world and all of these thoughts that might drive us, all of these events that might shape us in such negative ways that would cause us to run from and to live in and to reject and be rejected and all of that stuff, in the presence of God, those things come second. We do not have to be defined by the worst within us because of the presence of Jesus who overcomes even the darkest parts of our souls. We believe this. And not only do we believe this about ourselves, we believe this about the people around us, right? Why do we do what we do as a church? Is it just to pat ourselves on the back because we found Jesus? Yay, us, we're going to heaven? Or is it to come together for a purpose that this message of Jesus would go beyond these walls, go beyond me? That the one who has encountered me in the darkness of my soul and overcame it and allowed me to new life can do that in the life of another. If we don't believe this, what are we doing? Do we even have that motivation to look at the people around us and not see all of their problems and all that we did, everything we helped, we put them in change, we threw them in jail. We tried to get them help, we signed them up for this group. That, do we believe that underneath all the tragedies and the hurts and the choices and the darkness, there's a human being that was created by God, loved by God, and can find salvation through Christ. Do we see that? Or do we only see the trouble? Do we only see a wild man on a beach? Better to be avoided than engaged. I want you to keep that in your thoughts as we go forward. Because now we do need to talk about the demons and the pigs. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Do those words toss you a little bit sideways? When you start hearing about demons and like, why pigs? And why did they have to drown? I mean, this story gets complicated, and it gets complicated in ways that are hard for us to grip. And there's been all sorts of speculation on all of these things. There's been efforts to explain away both. Some people say this story didn't actually happen. It's just a reference to a, a larger work that Jesus did. There's all kinds of things that we've done to explain away these two ideas of demons and pigs. I don't want to run away from this. I think the Bible is clear. And I think the Bible gives us what we need to better understand not just what it's saying, but our own life and our own reality. And so we need to talk about this, a demon, as we do. And again, reference number two, not a horror movie. Confession time. Has anybody ever seen the movie The Exorcist? Yeah, some of you are just in trouble, aren't you? I read a study as I was preparing for this that much of what we call spiritual warfare 
is more based out of that movie than it is out of the Bible. Because we like the drama. We like the drama. And so we want to read that into it. And if the guy can twist his head around in a circle, then, oh, now we know it's a demon. You know, that kind of thing. It's dramatic. It's not, that's not what this is about. Don't put it into its own separate category that's far removed from our daily life and existence. A demon in this day could be anything that is unexplained and destructive. There's no reason for this man to be acting this way. We don't understand it. He must have a demon. There's a psychological stuff. There are all kinds of things that nowadays we put science language to, but in that time they attributed to the work of spirit. And you know what? They're not wrong. And neither is a science. There is an element in our lives that is unexplained, whether it's biological, whether it's something that we've brought into ourselves, uh, whether it's supernatural, all of that. There is this. If you've ever dealt with or in yourself or with another or someone who is clinically depressed, it goes beyond logic. It goes beyond reason. What would cause someone, a literal fly just flew into my ear, I apologize. <laughs> Not a demonic tick, I promise. <laughs> Satan, sorry. And the fly landed on me again, just if you can't see that out there. If you've ever dealt with someone, perhaps it's addiction. It could be all kinds of stuff. They're not responding in a way that makes any sense at all. And despite all of our best efforts clinically and in science, we can't just fix it. We can't. There's something else that's going on here. And we shy away from the term demon, and I think that's fine, because again, the movies. But there's a destructive force that's at work in a life. And sometimes you have to acknowledge it. In fact, I would say that you're never going to heal it unless you acknowledge it. I mean, how many people have I met that are, I would look at and talk to and say, this person seems very depressed. But if you actually ask them about it, nope, I'm fine. Right? There's nothing wrong with me. You can't get help until you name it. And it is interesting to me that Jesus is asking this man to name it. And you could talk of who's speaking here, legion, demon, all that kind of stuff. But again, don't walk down too far into the movie world. But what I'm hearing is a human being acknowledging that there are so many things that are destructive in his life, so many things that have moved him out of control, so many things that have placed him in a space that society cannot accept him and he can't accept himself. To live amongst the tombs the way he did? Who knows? I mean, who knows? But what we do know is there's more going on with this man than just a medical issue. It's more than just a choice he's made. There's a presence and a power at work within him that is supernatural and acknowledged as such by everyone who's there. There is such things that are amongst us as well. And we need Jesus to do it. Did you notice that the demons were afraid. Have you come to torment me? There's fear. We weren't afraid of anything else. This man is not described as fearful. He's described as wild. He overcame everything. But in the presence of Jesus, 
They're afraid. What are they afraid of? Jesus is greater than all evil. Jesus is the greater power, supernaturally. And judgment is coming. What are the, these demons that are speaking through this man? What are, what are they afraid of? How is it stated that he would throw them into the abyss? Now, that's a big, complicated word. But it's actually the same fear the disciples had when they were in the midst of the storm. That they would, the boat would come up and they would sink into the abyss. The abyss is that place that is removed from God, removed from life, removed from all things. And it's also mentioned in Revelation, is it not? Where, where does the Satan and all evil get thrown? Into the abyss. I was trying to cue that up for you so you could just kind of hit it, making sure everybody's paying attention. It is that place where they're just done. They're gone. They're locked away. And they have no power at all anywhere. That is the destiny of evil. That is the destiny of all this destructive nature, of all that is just against God. The abyss is that destiny. Judgment is coming, and it still is. And they're aware of it. It's inevitable. And in Christ, these destructive, this personification of evil that the demons represent, they saw their end. And they were afraid. Too often in churches I hear more talk about Satan than I do about Jesus. Oh, Satan's doing that. Satan's tempting me. Satan's, Satan did that. I stubbed my toe. Satan. This fly. Satan. Maybe. I mean, it's this joke that society looks at and looks at our churches and sees a bunch of people pointing at Satan. What? Who's got the power? And if we're Christians, where do we stand? What can Satan do to you? There's a whole conversation here about who Satan is, what it works, the accuser, all this other kind of stuff. Again, we've movieized this so much. Movieized, I just invented that. Somebody trademark it. We've movieized this so much, we can't see the truth through it all. Jesus had the power and the authority to overcome the personification of evil and destructiveness that this man was demonstrating. And it wasn't any small demon in the sense. It's legion. Many. And Jesus had the power to destroy them. Does and will. And that's the Christ I serve. I don't need to be afraid. I need to live. But how about them pigs? That's a whole lot of bacon in the bottom of the ocean, isn't it? Or the lake, the sea. Pigs were unclean to Jewish people. To eat one was to be separate from God. Demons had a similar uncleanliness, a separateness from God. A pig had no value in Jewish culture. A Greek understanding of how demons work and the supernatural work, it would actually be uh, understanding in stories, there are many, of a demon exiting someone and going into an animal. Uh, even the personification of these demons is animalistic in nature. This is not something that the people in that day and age would see as odd. The pigs died, and thus is the fate of all evil, and thus is the fate of those 
who welcome it. It's not really about the pigs. It's not really about the swine herd. They are a picture of uncleanliness, separateness from God. They're an escape for this destructive and evil nature away from the abyss. And where do they end up anyway? Drowned in the abyss. Don't make a big deal about the pigs. Eat your bacon, it's all right. Right, Emily? She said publicly. What's going on here? is Jesus demonstrating his power over. And there's literally nothing that these demons, this destructive personification of evil can do to overcome Jesus. Nothing. Or even get away from him. The bigger point of the story is what happens to the man. And this is the part I think we need to pay the most attention to. Is the once wild man is now set free. The swine herds, having no more swines to herd, they go tell the city, they go tell the countryside, they go tell everybody, hey, look what happened. And a crowd starts to gather. And what do they find? They find this formerly wild man sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and of his right mind. The uncontrollable force of destruction this dehumanized person that they'd done everything to help but nothing worked is now at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed, calm, speaking, rational, alive, human. Jesus' supernatural power to both destroy evil and restore people. Don't separate those. To destroy what was wrong and evil and to restore humanity. The evil within this man is done. And now he gets to be human. He's not to be defined any further by his nakedness or his violence. He will forever now be defined by the restorative salvific salvation work that Jesus did in him. Because that's always the work of Jesus. He is the recreator. He is the redeemer. And he is the savior. And that's what he does. No power at work within us, no matter how evil, can overcome the salvation, the redemption found in Christ. I was hoping for an amen on that one. Nothing can. The crowd is left fear-filled. Why? They ask Jesus to leave. In one voice, they all, all who were gathered, you get out of here, Jesus. This story terrified them. Remember who they are. They're not Jewish, they're Gentile. And there's a whole lot of Roman references in the story that I did not want to dig into. But if you ever wanted to, Jesus is making a very clear point that isn't just about a man and the demons and the pigs. About not just his power supernaturally, but his power politically. People seem to be afraid that Jesus would upend their way of life. If Jesus can take that guy and make him into this one, what can he do? What will he do? If a whole herd of pigs is now drowned in the sea, what could happen? Jesus was something they could not explain or explain away. He remains someone that we can't fully explain and people can't explain away despite their efforts to do so. And I believe we need to be careful here because today the people that seem most afraid of Jesus are often found in churches. Jesus has a way of upsetting the apple cart, of changing the status quo, 
of reaching people who might be considered unreachable. And then he puts them in our midst. That former drunk with a reputation as a cheat all of a sudden might become the worship leader. That's a true story from a church I served. That person you don't expect anything from. In the presence of God, humanity is restored and they get to live the life that they were created to live. And too often we put roadblocks in that way. I've been in ministry 20 years, serving churches full time for 20 years. I've seen it a lot. I've gotten a lot of flack. Well, how can you trust that person? Why would you let them be in charge of? Because you know what? My God is greater than. Sometimes it doesn't work out, it's okay. Sometimes it does. And the one who is far away from God now becomes not just a servant of the Lord, but a necessary part of God's work in this world. And when we stand as gatekeeper to that, we stand in the wrong spot because this is God's church. It has been and it always will be. And one of the biggest sins we find in churches all over this country and all over this world is when we take the things that are God's and we make them about us. Because we're afraid that if God does what God can do, that's going to change things. And we don't like that. Not just in churches politically, but in ourselves as well. What if you're not defined by the depression or your anxiety or your addiction or the mistake you made when you were a teenager or a young adult or the one you made yesterday? What if you aren't defined by that divorce or that death or that harsh word? What if you're not defined by the worst mistake you've ever made, but you are defined by the creator and savior, Christ? What can God do with that? People are fearful of walking into a church, not because they're afraid of Jesus, because they expect to be judged by the ones who God has put together to demonstrate his love and his salvation. Let's change that. His story's not quite done yet. And I want to end on a positive note because that's where the story ends. The man wants to go with Jesus. And Jesus didn't allow it. He told him to return home. He told him to tell others what had happened. Why? Because Jesus was preparing the way. It wasn't time yet for the Gentiles to receive salvation. That's going to come later. And it did come later. And people like this, like this formerly demon-filled wild man, they're the first to spread the good news, to prepare the way for the apostles and the Holy Spirit. We're never going to learn this man's name. We see him restored, we see the power and authority of Jesus, and we see the good news spread. It's a powerful story. I mean, everybody knew who this guy was. And after this, everybody knew who Jesus was. It's your story too. Now maybe you didn't have to live amongst the tombs naked in order to have it happen. But we're a story the darkness within that receives the light of Christ. It's not a fanciful tale. It's not told with all sunshine and roses. It owns the reality of what is happening in our current struggles as well. But it points us to hope. 
I'm not the same person today I was last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Because God allows me to face this darkness. And through him, the light comes. This is our story. Might not be so dramatic, yet it has similarity. We need Christ. We have a need, just like that man that stood on that shore. We find the presence of God in Christ. He is present with us. We encounter the Savior. And then we receive our call. That which we are meant to do. And this man was to go home and tell the story. That was his duty. And that was his call. And I wonder if that might be ours as well. We like to make everything fit into easy to understand boxes and so we can fill out our spreadsheets and say well I talked to this many people about Jesus this week and I prayed this many prayers and I read this many verses and all of that kind of stuff but you know what hey, all those things are great but behind it is a heart behind it is a heart that says I have encountered the presence of God and I am different I've got darkness, but because of Jesus, I've got light. And the light is greater than the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. If I'm quoting scripture, yes. If it sounds like I'm quoting scripture, yes, I am. A fundamental truth. And if the light is greater than the darkness, then that is the one that we are to serve. And we can go out from this place, we can come into this place through our whole lives, through how we interact and what we do. We can demonstrate this salvation, this redemption, this life that Jesus gives. I catch flack sometimes for being a chaplain. People say, well, you're not really a Christian because you're not supposed to you know, pray the sinner's prayer with people and all that other kind of stuff. And I look at him and say, every single room I walk into, I bring the presence of God with me. And yeah, my job isn't to go in there and pound the Bible on him. But I am one saved by grace. And there's no escaping that. And every act of love that, and compassion that I give is from Christ. An ear that hears, a soul that cares, someone to see, not a disease, not the anger, not the tears, but the human that needs Jesus. That's me, that's you, that's us, and that's our call. I can't tell you what it looks like. But I can tell you that God is calling you to go to your homes and to live out this light, this salvation that you know. And I hope you do know it. And do it in such a way that this is all about Jesus and not about me. Last thought. You know what Jesus does immediately after he meets this guy? After the story? He gets on the boat and he leaves. He never makes it off the shore. Gets on the boat in Galilee, goes through a storm, calms the store, storm, shows up on the boat, shows up on the shore, meets this demon possessed wild man, casts out the demons, restores the man talks to the crowd that's there. They tell him to leave. He takes his disciples, gets back on the boat, and rows across the way. And who's left? The former wild man. History isn't clear exactly what happens in this region. But one of the stories that has come out is that when this region was given an opportunity to respond to Christ as Lord and Savior, they were already ready. 
they already knew because of this man who's not got a name who did exactly what Jesus called him to do never learn his name but the whole community is changed because of his service and if a wild man like this can do that what could you do Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we come into your presence again and we ask your Holy Spirit to speak. Lord, as much as we don't want to identify with this wild man in Scripture, as much as we don't want to acknowledge just how dark things can be for us, Lord, help us in these moments to see ourselves here as one who has knelt before you, was cried out to you, and received the, the restoration, the reconciliation, the redemption and salvation that you offer. And Lord, help us not just see that, but to hear your words, to call us, to challenge us, to go back to our home, to go back to the place where we live right here, and show the world, and, and through our lives, through our actions, through our words, demonstrate just what your love can do. What your light is like. Lord, help us to see people as you see them. Not for all their flaws, but for what you created them to be. And Lord, we pray that you would cause us to interact in this community in such a way that people would be drawn to you. That the way would be prepared for your spirit to do its work. And Lord, as intimidating as that might sound to us, it's really just a matter of living the life that you've given us to live. Help us to do it intentionally, to not shy away from it, to not be afraid if someone makes a comment or if somebody works against us or we make a mistake, but to keep ourselves rooted in the simple, clear reality that your power, your authority, and your light are greater than any darkness around us. And Lord, as we live in that light, show us the way forward. And Lord, we ask this in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. As always, you are invited and challenged. If you'd like, I'd love to pray with you, talk with you if you need that. Um, I'm going to put a plug in for the directory because... It's nice to be able to contact people if we have the correct information and not get a, this number is no longer in service message. So if you have that, it would be fully appropriate to fill that out and return it to one Mr. Kim Martin. Uh, uh, if not, the big man's coming for you. Or you can put them in the basket on the door, whatever is easiest. But. Uh, and uh, my wife and I, we're going to be going to Arby's today for lunch because that's where we like to go now. So uh, if you anybody wants to join us, just show up. We'll be there. As you leave from this place today, may the light of Christ go with you. The light that overcomes all darkness, may it shine upon you. May you know the salvation of Christ. And may you show others his love and his grace. Amen? Amen. Go in the peace and love of Christ.